Hello, here I am, and there you are, and welcome to another great episode of Stand Up. I've got an awesome guest joining me today, former ABC News anchor and now CNN's chief climate correspondent and author of a really interesting and important new book about climate. It's Bill Weir for the first time on the show. Great conversation. And if you want to jump to it, it starts at about 21 minutes in. But I've got a whole bunch of news and sound clips as I do pretty much every day for you. So let's get started, shall we? All eyes were on a Manhattan courtroom to watch the disgraced former president close his eyes and fall asleep. That's right. Trump's criminal trial began with jury selection yesterday. And apparently Trump took a little nappy poo. And I'll have some more sound on that for you coming up. But New York prosecutors joined the disgraced former president and his stupid attorneys in a Manhattan courtroom for the official start of the first criminal trial of an American president ever. The disgraced former president is facing 34 felony counts of falsifying business records to cover up a sex scandal that he had with a porn star during the 2016 campaign. If he's convicted, he could face up to four years in prison. So after the judge overseeing the case rejected Trump's latest effort to oust him, the judge, the prosecution and defense began collaborating on the arduous process of choosing a jury. Immediately, they ran into problems because more than half the pool of 96 prospective jurors were dismissed after they indicated they did not believe they could be impartial and court adjourned for the day with zero jurors chosen. A surprisingly rare high initial failure underscoring the challenges of seating an impartial jury for defendant whom most of the country has already made up its mind about. And a lot of people in Manhattan certainly don't like because we've known him. I say we. I lived in Manhattan for a long time. I used to see the guy. I mean, I saw him drive by me once. Everybody knows Manhattan. Everybody knows Trump in Manhattan and his history. The trial, perhaps the only one against Trump that will unfold before a Election day is projected to take about six weeks, the judge told the prospective jurors, but it could stretch out longer if jury selection turns out to be especially time-consuming. The process will be crucial for both sides, but could be especially challenging for the defense, who the New York Times says will effectively be searching for red needles in Manhattan's giant blue haystack. The headline at Politico last night, Politico Nightly, was, When the Circus Came to Manhattan. I thought this was interesting. They write, Sure, it was the so-called trial of the century, but the scene outside former President Donald Trump's hush money trial that the first criminal trial of a former American president was more like a sad circus than anything else. Beneath billowing giant Trump or death and Trump 2024 flags, a few dozen Trump supporters gathered in a park across the street. In the past, Trump had always been able to count on his supporters turning out in mass from his signature rallies to the riot at the Capitol. But today in Manhattan, a pivotal moment for the MAGA movement and Trump's campaign, the faithful were uncharacteristically quiet. The endless litany of Trump's legal proceedings seemed to be wearing on them. More than two hours after the New York Young Republicans Club rally for President Trump was scheduled to begin, demonstrators were still heavily outnumbered by hundreds of members of the news media. All right, I've got some more sound and reaction to day one coming up, but let's get to other important news stories from yesterday, including what's happening in the Middle East as Israel's war cabinet met to weigh a response to Iran. Arch villain Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu facing conflicting pressures as he considers whether and how to retaliate against Iran for its missile and drone attack over the weekend. Some far-right members of his government have called for an immediate military response, while international leaders, including our president, Joe Biden, have urged Israel to de-escalate. Netanyahu's war cabinet met again yesterday, but so far there's been no response to the attack. And rather than preparing the public for a showdown with its arch rival, the government signaled a return to relative normalcy, lifting restrictions on large gatherings and allowing schools to reopen, according to the New York Times and many other media outlets. Let's see, what else do I have for you? Record ocean temperatures have put so much stress on the world's coral reefs that they are losing their vital algae. Scientists warning of the widest ever threat to coral. It's a process referred to as bleaching on an unprecedented scale. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration projected that the current crisis would, within weeks, become the most extensive bleaching event on record. And another NOAA official said that more than 54% of the world's coral area has experienced bleaching level heat stress in the past year, and that figure is increasing about 1% a week. That doesn't seem like good news. Congress is targeting a Chinese firm that makes key U.S. drugs, Wu Shi Aptek is the name of it. It's among the Chinese drug companies that lawmakers have identified as a potential threat to the security of Americans' genetic information and U.S. intellectual property. 
Thought that was an interesting story to follow. Yesterday, Tesla reported that they would lay off 10% of their workforce. Goldman Sachs earned nearly $4 billion in profit for the first quarter. They reported around $1 billion more than analysts expected. So that's a pretty insane number for that bank that's wrecked America over and over, in my opinion. Uh, in New York, lawmakers reach a deal in a framework to address one of the Trump media shares fell 18% yesterday. They're down more than 50% since the first days of trading. Apparently, that has some connection to the first day of Trump's first criminal trial. Let's see what else. The FBI has opened a criminal investigation into the cargo ship that slammed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge and caused it to collapse in Baltimore last month, according to two senior law enforcement officials familiar with the investigation. In Ukraine, Ukrainian officials plead for more Western arms. A U.S. aid package remains stalled in Congress. Russia is advancing on the battlefield in eastern Ukraine, seizing new territory and intensifying attacks that capture the town of Chasiv Yar and others in the Donetsk region. Rising inflation in March didn't deter customers who continued shopping at a more rapid pace than anticipated, according to the Commerce Department Monday. Retails increased 0.7% for the month, considerably faster than the Dow Jones consensus forecast. In disgraced and corrupt New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez's case, prosecutors continued to undercut his claims. Some of the cash found in the New Jersey Democrats' home was wrapped in bands showing it had been withdrawn, at least $10,000 at a time from a bank where Mr. Menendez and his wife had no known depository account. This, prosecutor said, indicated the money had been provided to them by another person. And how about this? Good news on crime rates. Homicides in American cities are falling at the fastest pace in decades bringing them the closest to levels they were before a pandemic-era jump. Nationwide, homicides dropped around 20% in 133 cities from the beginning of the year through the end of March, compared with the same period in 2023. And what's this all about? Conservative Supreme Court Justice, who is also a disgrace, Justice Clarence Thomas, not present at the court for oral arguments Monday. No reason given for his absence. Boy, I hope everything is all right with Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Here's a case worth watching. Progressive media watchdog Media Matters for America celebrated a legal win Friday against that federal judge has imposed a preliminary injunction against Ken Paxton. The Texas attorney general who sought to investigate the group after it reported on white nationalist content appearing on X, formerly Twitter. And finally, fish off the Florida Keys have been starting to swim upside down, spinning and then dying. Scientists are trying to race to figure out why. And congratulations to anyone and everyone who ran in the Boston Marathon as well. Those are your headlines. Now let's get to some of the sound clips I've got for you today and hope most days right here on Stand Up. All right, everybody was talking about Trump falling asleep on day one, as reported apparently by New York Times and CNN's Maggie Haberman. Here she is with that report talking to Jake Tapper yesterday afternoon. Yeah, I have to ask you guys have been at the Times have been live blogging uh, this uh, event. And 40 minutes ago, you wrote an observation that that uh, I, I was very surprised. Trump appears to be sleeping. His head keeps dropping down and his mouth goes slack. Tell us about that. Well, Jake, he appeared to be asleep, and you know, repeatedly his his head would would fall down. There have been other moments in other trials, like the uh, the Agent Carroll trial, which was around the corner uh, in January, where he appeared very still and seemed as if he might be sleeping, but then he then he would move. This time, he didn't pay attention to a note that his lawyer Todd Blanche passed him. His jaw kept falling on his chest, and his mouth kept going slack. Now, uh, you know, sometimes people do fall asleep during court proceedings, but it, it's notable given the intensity of this morning and a lot of what was being argued. Yeah, that's rather surprising. Rather surprising. <laughs> well, my friend JoJo in Jersey Suites, honestly, let him sleep. Wheel him into a fake Oval Office in the back nine of Trump National. Tell him he's the president. Hand him a Diet Coke and a hamburger. Play, play a nature video. Quietly close the door and walk away. Hashtag Sleepy Don. Richard Ojeda. For someone who always screams Sleepy Joe, Donald Trump sure is having a hard time staying awake during his own trial. Here is uh, Rachel Maddow destroying Donald Trump on MSNBC yesterday get here. You know, the, the wheels of justice grind slowly. I did not think they would grind so slowly that they would rock the defendant apparently to sleep at the defense table today. I, I, I mean, I have to say, I, I do. I was not there. I do not know if he was asleep. It is possible he was, you know, meditating or, or just resting his eyes or something. I don't know. But like, that's those headlines, you know, on the front page of the New York Times, front page of the Washington Post, front page of the Huffington Post, front page of multiple news outlets today coming out of this, that Trump appeared to fall asleep 
on the first day of his trial, those are going to stick. I mean, I know it's not the most important legal thing, but we are in the middle of a campaign. And the, you know, the age issue is the main thing the Trump campaign wants to use against his opponent, the whole Sleepy Joe thing. I mean, this is, as you said, Ari, this is the most historic thing that Donald Trump has ever done. No president ever has been, no former president ever has been a criminal defendant. And on day one, the headlines coming out of it are that he appeared to doze off. Yes, exactly. Uh, on Twitter, Fred Wellman says, has there ever been a time in years we've seen Trump truly in public for like a whole day at a time? They can't hide him when he's sitting in the courtroom all day. This is going to be very eye opening. Well, for us, daddy Saudi bucks is going to sleep every day. <laughs> Dan Fiverr says, if Trump's too old and weak to say wake his own criminal trial, what do you think is going to happen in the situation room? Well, here's Chris Hayes on the same issue. Well, just to, to Rachel's point about the, the campaign dynamics, the optics of all this and the and the um, <clears throat> sustained eye resting that apparently happened in the courtroom. I mean, I do feel like if you if you call your opponent Sleepy Joe, you have one job Stay for away. the rest of the campaign, yeah. which is like you got to like <laughs> clockwork orange them. those puppies <laughs> like open at all times. But it's also interesting, too, to imagine. I mean, again, this man, who I think is not a particularly emotionally regulated individual and does not have a tremendous degree of self-mastery and discipline in a situation in which, to your point, Ari, he doesn't control things, in which he doesn't control the pace, the conversations are happening outside of his purview, but he has to sit there and watch it. I mean, it is I, I really can't think of a thing that's more nightmarish in some ways for him, just at a personal level of like, you don't, you don't have like the stimulus. You don't, you're not getting like little ego bumps from some social media replies. And you just got to sit there and watch this day after day. I mean, this was day one. This is weeks and weeks of this. So just at the most sort of human level, I was just watching the reports today and thinking about just the sheer psychological torture. I really mean that. That is this. And then also the point that he keeps making, which is which is true, although not for the reasons he says, which is he's not on the campaign trail talking to people like he's not doing events with like, you know, the 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 farmers in Michigan or some whatever swing state rally he would be doing. He's sitting in a courtroom in New York where he's accused of serious crimes and felonies where a serious case is going to be presented. All right. Well, all eyes are on that Manhattan courtroom. They weren't necessarily apparently with Fox News. No, they were paying attention to another story that pro-Palestinian protesters were blocking major U.S. transportation infrastructure across the country from San Francisco's Golden Gay Bridge to the entrance to Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. And uh, let's see, a lot of Republicans were chirping about that on Fox News. Here's tough guy Tom Cotton, Republican senator from Arkansas, calling for Americans to take matters into their own hands. I agree with you that you have to get to these pro or these uh, criminals early. If something like this happened in Arkansas on a bridge there, let's just say I think there'd be a lot of very wet criminals that have been tossed overboard, not by law enforcement, but by the people whose uh, road they're blocking. If they glued their hands to a car or a, the pavement, well, probably pretty painful to have their skin ripped off. But I think that's what, the way we'd handle in Arkansas. And I would encourage most people anywhere that get stuck behind criminals like this uh, who are trying to block traffic to take matters in their own hands. There's only usually a few of them, and there's a lot of people being inconvenienced. It's time to put an end to this nonsense. Oh, he's such a tough guy. I'd love to see him go out there and try to confront one of those protesters and throw him over the bridge and see what happens. Oh, there goes Tom Cotton. He's fallen into the water. Mm, so sad. All right. What a ridiculous, awful thing to say and way to be and, well, just gross. Uh, speaking of gross, here's another Republican senator. This is Katie Britt. She also was on Fox News yesterday wearing a big, giant crucifix and yet saying this in support of a disgraceful man. Uh, so, Senator, you're a legislator, but you're also a lawyer. Yes. Do you feel like the president can get a fair trial here in New York? No, I mean, look at what we're seeing. This is the left um, continuing to, to melt down over Donald Trump. They are obsessed. I mean, there is a reason both the federal prosecutors and state prosecutors said we are not going to move forward with this. And then you have Alvin Bragg enter into the arena and want to make a name for himself. People know that. People are sick of the two-tiered system of justice that we're seeing. And I think that the more the media can talk about this, which we're going to see them do, then the less they have to talk about what a disaster this country is under Joe Biden. They know people want Donald Trump back in the White House, and they absolutely cannot stand And like I said, crime is going way down and the economy is on fire. But OK, that's the report from Earth 2. And I thought this was a powerful clip. This is uh, the 
former first lady, former senator and secretary of state, obviously candidate for president. This is Hillary Clinton talking to Kelly Clarkson on her TV show about the Arizona Supreme Court upholding an 1864 abortion ban. I feared it would happen, but I hoped it wouldn't happen. And now here we are in the, you know, the middle of this very difficult period for women in about half the states of our country uh, who cannot get the care that they need. And the uh, the old law in uh, Arizona is, you know, without exceptions. It Mm -hmm. is. and, And, you know, as an aside, the the man who wrote that law was married, I think, four times, and one of his wives was 12. Two of his wives were 15. I mean, so I'm glad we're getting advice oh, from an outstanding yeah. let, citizen let's, let's, of the community. Let's yeah. go. Let's go back to that yeah. that era, and uh, and and the you know the danger to to women's lives as well as to our you know right to make our own decisions about our bodies and ourselves is so profound. And there's another element to it, which I find so troubling. I mean, there's a, a kind of cruelty to it. I mean, you know, no exceptions for rape, incest. I mean, really? I mean, what kind of world is that? And and also, I have been pregnant twice, hospitalized both times. I mean, literally, I asked God, this is a real thing to just take me and my son in the hospital the second time. Because I was like, it's the worst thing. I didn't know I'd get emotional. Sorry. It's okay. Because you're speaking for so many. You're speaking for literally millions of women in our country and around the world. And it, it, um, it was just the worst. And they have some guy sitting in a Supreme Court in Arizona to or make a legislature. some women go through that? Whew. Yeah. It was my decision, you know, yeah. and I'm so glad I did. I love my babies. But to make someone... There, there, there is a, there's a, there's a, a cruelty toward women, toward yeah. women's lives, toward, and you don't realize how hard it is. Yeah, the fact that you would take that away from someone that can literally kill them. Right. The fact of their rape, the fact of the some by their family member, and they have to like that. It's just like insane to me. Yes, Kelly Clarkson. There you go. Thank you very much, Hillary Clinton, Kelly Clarkson. And finally, what I've got for you is the disgraced former president responding to the accusations that he fell asleep in court yesterday. This is late breaking. Let's take a, a listen. Sort of fake news. Uh, Trump fell asleep. No, no, no. It's called Sleepy Joe. It's called Wide Awake, Donald. It's called Wide Awake. And it's very sad. I see the Lincoln Project. Which, you know, they used to be successful. They used to be Lincoln Park. And they actually had some success. And then they got poor because they went against Trump and they had to move into Sleepy Joe government housing. So now they're the Lincoln Project. And soon they'll be the Lincoln homeless, or the left would say the unhoused people of Lincoln. Some stupid PC thing. But now people are saying, I fell asleep in the courtroom. No. No, I wouldn't do that. No, what happened was my lawyers who said to me, Sir, we need you very alert for your trial because you have invaluable insight and energy. That's what they said. They said energy, and they said insight. And so they gave me an energy drink to have right before the trial started because they wanted me alert. And it's called NyQuil. They said, Sir, you have to take at least two Two, you know, they said normal people can only handle one thimble. Uh, so you're going to need two. You're going to need, and I took three. I took three. And all of a sudden, I felt like a sort of strong superhero because everybody started talking very slow. Everybody was like, Mr. President <laughs> Trump, sir. And I was like, whoa, am I? It's like I'm in the Matrix. I'm <laughs> moving faster than everybody and with great strength. And I could probably stop bullets right now with my hand very nicely. And all of a sudden, you know, it was time for lunch. And I said, look at that. I'm basically time traveling at this point. All of a sudden it was lunchtime. And then I look, of course, and the fake news is saying, oh, Trump is falling asleep during his trial. No, no, no. It's not called sleep. It's called time travel. And, uh, you know, the left, oh, they don't want Trump to time travel. No, it'll just prove how much stronger I am than all of them. So we're looking forward to the trial in the afternoon. Uh, my legal team has now said that they want me to do uh, some a new energy drink. They say I've dominated NyQuil. They said, sir, you're going to eat propofol before the <laughs> afternoon session. So please uh, just let us hook you up to this and 
Oh boy, the left definitely doesn't want me on propofol. So we're doing strongly. We're doing great. The left is out of control and stupid. And we're going to win this trial like we're going to win all the other trials. And oh, my, uh, my lawyer is saying it's time for the propofol. So bye-bye, everybody. Get ready for even stronger Trump. <laughs> well, there you go. J.L. Colvin, actually, in case you didn't know, it's so good. All right. Well, that's all I've got for you. And I just want to remind you, can't do the show without you. This show is supported, sponsored by you, the paid subscriber, independent media each and every day. And I so appreciate those of you that have edited your pledge upward, which means paying more per month. You can always do that. And if not, sign up right now. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. But let's get to my guest, shall we? Very excited to have Bill Weir on the show. For the first time, I watched him over on ABC when he was an anchor and a journalist at Nightline there. And now he is at CNN as their chief climate correspondent. And he's written a new book, which is heartfelt and important and wonderful. I really liked it. I love their conversation. The book is called Life As We Know It Can Be. Stories of People, Climate, and Hope in a Changing World. The book starts with him reading a letter to his son. It's really poignant and wonderful. And Bill's a smart guy, a good guy. We had some real laughs while we were talking about this very important issue. And I'm super thankful for it and for him. Let's do it right now for with the first time. First time with Bill Weir on Twitter at Bill Weir CNN. Get the book. Watch him on CNN. Here we go. Oh, my God. There he is. Ladies and gentlemen, Beer, Bill Weir. You should see his face. It's perfect. His upper body is perfect. Your bio says you were the intro to your book says you were born in the letter to your uh, son in 1967. I can't believe you're that old. You look great, Bill. Thank you for joining me. Congratulations on this very important new book. Thank you, Pete. Yeah, no, I am Gen X, and I don't know. It's this kid is either going to kill me faster or keep me alive longer. I'm not sure which. Oh, the other thing, I wasn't done criticizing you. That voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's so sexy and manly, and you know it, right? Like you play it, right? Uh, you know that you have that voice. Do you do voiceover? Okay. Uh, no, I don't. I can't. This is I'm, I'm an indentured servant here at of course, CNN. Of course, so you're a journalist. Sell my, you can't, can't sell. sell my pipes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what's funny is I remember when I was in college, there was a professor who had great gravelly, like old 1970s FM DJ voice. And the kids were like, how do I talk to like you? And he said, vodka. Vodka. <laughs> and so <laughs> you know, we walked around blasted for a month trying to sound like that Dr. is John. hilarious. Work. <laughs> I would love to find out that you're a total phony and you really. Hi, this is Bill Weir is your natural voice. I would expose you and take all of your integrity when I found that. it's actually yeah. not Bill's real voice. Like, Truman Capote voice or something. Yeah. <laughs> That's a deep cut. But yeah, sure. Sure. I'm very excited to talk to you. I've obviously followed your career through ABC, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, a lot of Americans are familiar with you from your early days there and of course, covering sports. But I was really excited to find out that A, CNN was going to have somebody cover climate and B, that it was you. And I thought to myself, though, is why Bill Weir? And I, m m my question to you is, why did you want to do this? Tell us a little bit about what you covered, as long as you take as much time as you want, because you did sure. sports, you, you did everything. You did Nightline. So what issue or person did you not cover before you arrived at the most important issue of our time? <laughs> Yeah, it was a circuitous route where I came up through local sports and I was a wise ass morning show guy. And then I actually tried your world. I, I spent a year in L.A. as like a Hollywood cliche trying to sell scripts and shooting pilots and doing stand up. And oh, you going did improv. stand up? I did stand up for a year. Why? And Why would you even be funny with your good looks and, and healthy <laughs> physique? What made you develop You know what it was? Years? It was, I was so burned out on local news mm. that it was a way for me to vent all of the frustrations I had with my co-anchors and the banality of it and That's cool. getting my work blown out by high speed chases on the 405. We were addicted to anything without a scripted ending. And it was riffing on all of that kind of stuff. It was, I did, I did a bit, the best bit I did was we were trying to decide whether to become parents at the time. And I would say, I love kids. We love children, but we also love 
Sharp objects, open flames, fine dining, business class, vomit-free clothing, Lego-free floors, uncensored profanity, busy intersections, lead-based paint, mini blinds, skydiving, motorcycling, profanity, sleep, silence, and you just went on and wow, on. Wow, you nailed it still. <laughs> That's hilarious. I have one question. You guys liked lead-based paint? You liked it. <laughs> that didn't feel like a thing that freedom-loving just, adults... It, it was just a, it was a basket That's hilarious. Of childhood. That's anyway, a great but, bit. And so you did that for, on the so side. I did that really, for a while, but yeah. then all my pilots got killed and we had my daughter, Olivia, we became parents and ABC news called and they had been following me since I did this morning show in Chicago that was popular. Actually, I auditioned for The Daily Show when Kilborn left, when they were panicking. Jon Stewart hadn't decided to do it yet, oh, and they wow. just brought in a bunch of idiots. But then ABC News gave me this like path to a legitimate international correspondent. I was working with Peter Jennings, and we were working with my hero, and going to, all over the world. And I'd be at the White House one week, or Oscars the next, and really it's the last days of disco and sort of network news. And at one point, Diane Sawyer said, I had some interesting things going on in China. And it was 2004. You should go over there and explain China to us. And her, her opinion was just gold. And so it's the first time I had an open-ended assignment. And I said, this is what I want to do. And the series went well. And then I went, did one on India. And then it was like, where do you want to go? They started asking me and that spoiled me a bit. And I was at Nightline for a few years and then followed sort of my mentor, Amy Antullis, who brought me I know uh, Amy. Along. I know Amy, yeah. Amy. From CNN, She's yeah. a revered TV sort yeah. of executive and talent scout and just a, a brilliant person and just an investor in good stories, like really believes in the story. And I came over to CNN thinking I was going to do prime time. I had all these ideas on how to reinvent an hour in prime time, a lot more field segments, a lot more remote stuff. And they were going to have a bake off with me and Don Lemon. Uh, like who gets nine o'clock, who gets 10. And we, at first it was, they weren't going to put me on the air at all. And we're sitting around talking about, well, what would you do Monday? If like you had a show Monday, what would you do? And I looked up and it was the moment Rob Ford, the mayor of Toronto was admitting he had smoked crack. And I'm like, I'm going to Toronto. Like right now I want to talk to his constituents. And so I went up there and, and got Rob Ford. And, and so they threw me on the air with that story. Then they threw me on the air when the Malaysian airliner went missing. And I was talking about the same story every day for a month and just, oh, oh I made a horrible mistake here. At least at Nightline, we had variety and I want to have all these creative ideas. I want to yeah. show range. And But to my boss's credit, they said, why don't you do a series like Bourdain? The one we want to do is travel documentary stuff. What would you do? And I pitched him a show called The Wonder List, which is I want to go to the wonders of the world and wonder what will be left of them for my daughter, who's going to turn my age in the year 2050. And so we shot in like almost 30 countries, three seasons of that. It was the best job ever, as you can imagine. Was that the best thing you ever did? The Wonderless? It was great. Oh, it's- yeah. Yeah. Just in terms of the license to look at a globe and go, wonder what's going on in New yeah. Zealand or Madagascar. Sure. And just go there and figure out what the story is sure. as we go and then just and tackle big issues. And I became fascinated with sort of the collision between nature and human nature. I love the wilderness. I love the outdoors. My dad was this kind of brilliant high school dropout who would take me backpacking and say, explain the geology and the really? tribal history, and then would say, and just wait, some asshole is going to come screw this up with a golf course. Like he was this, a realist. And so it filled me with this equal sense of wonder and worry about how quickly we can lose these places. Did your dad ever and change his opinion on golf? What's <laughs> My dad might say, sounds like we have the same dad. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I hate now, yeah, yeah, he was not a golfer. Where did you grow man. up? So I was originally born in Milwaukee, and uh, my parents were split when I was a baby. And then my mom became a really zealous evangelical Christian who, when I was nine, announced at breakfast that she'd had a dream from God, and God wanted us to move to Texas so she could go to Bible school and become a televangelist. And she put me on the phone with my dad, who had joint custody, to negotiate out of it. And he let us go, and then the dreams kept coming. So I went to 17 schools in six states Holy shit. across the Bible Belt. And then I'd go back every summer and Christmas to hang out with my dad, who he was a homicide detective who was drinking himself to death, quit his job, moved to the mountains outside of Aspen, and worked in a lumber yard. And so I'd had this atheist, humanist, outdoorsman father, and my mother, who was very deep into speaking in tongues and faith healing. <laughs> And bouncing around to these like strip mall or mega churches in the Bible Belt. Ugh. And it turned out to be great training for this job because when you're always the new kid, 
you learn how to read a room and empathize. Yeah. And my best friends in the world, I got them in Oklahoma and I got them in Malibu. And I understand why they vote the way they vote and how they think the way they think. And and so I'm grateful for my gypsy youth. Yeah, it sounds like you took the adversity and even when you look at it now, you turned it into what, like what you just said. It made you who you are. And in a lot of ways, it was good. But God, you wouldn't wish that on your kids. <laughs> I wouldn't. But, I wouldn't. And, and I wrestle with that a little bit in a book because I'm thinking about it now in terms of like climate migration and where should my kid live? Where's a haven? Yeah. What latitude do you aim for? And when I was a a Syracuse. A ro- the answer is Syracuse. Syracuse. Buffalo is actually the one. Yeah, I grew up. But, I grew up in Syracuse, and so my parents know. are still there in a lovely home in a rural-ish area, and that's where I grew up. And it's like a friend of mine is a farmer there, and he's planting trees that, in ten years, as a result of the climate, will live in zone I think six. As opposed to they'll live in New York, they'll thrive in New York the way they only used to in Maryland yeah. or Point South. I think I've got it right. Or even Georgia, like peaches and stuff yeah. that normally wouldn't. So he's adapting his crop to the way the climate is changing in Smart. central New York. Not to throw us off about where where to live, but I'm, I'm sure you get into we can get into more of that. But the book, let's just talk a little bit more about your career covering climate and what you've seen, because it, yeah. all, it all brings you to this amazing fascinating book that you've written, right? I mean, go ahead. So that's the point that I I didn't finish your initial question was about how'd you end up in the climate beat? So I had done this wondrous job. And then when Trump won, it it changed the appetite for the viewership and that. And, and they said, we need to, we, we want to create a climate desk. And I had resisted a beat most of my career. I wanted to be a generalist. I like politics and I also like entertainment. I just don't want to eat the same thing every day. But then I realized this beat is the beat that encompasses everything. Foreign policy, health care, economy, food, transportation, shelter is all within a, a planet in balance and is being stressed in new ways because we've created a whole new planet for ourselves that we really don't know how things work yet. And and so I jumped into it and got really dark for the first couple of years when I realized the enormity of it. And you talk to these scientists after a glass of red wine and they really let their fears out and you understand just how much damage is already baked in. But then I was supposed to turn this book in a couple of years ago, but enough happened in the world. And I met enough really inspiring people that I, I, I have more wonder than worry. I'd still worry, but there's so much good going on. The stories that I just don't generally have enough time to tell about this industrial revolution that's happening right under our feet that we don't even noticing. And, and, so I'm trying to balance out and live on this edge between worry and wonder and hope and fear. And I think we're going to have to raise our kids to have that kind of mindset. Yeah. And you do a good job. And the intro with the the letter to your son and throughout the book with having that being a consideration. It's a great book for parents. It's a great for, book for anybody because we're all in this together to a certain extent. One might argue not, however, if you look at the politics of it all. And so right. I, I just want to ask you the one thing I knew I wanted to ask you before we, we got to the book, given your work as a journalist, is how do you how have you remained or how can you remain in any way objective politically when the Republican Party in America is the only political party in the world that is in denial about the climate consensus. How, how do you handle that? I have always been a biased partisan. I'm an outspoken activist, as a matter of fact, specifically, primarily on this issue, but a lot of other issues I'm a staunch progressive on. But you have to, as a, a, trying to approach it as a journalist, it's I don't know how you can be objective and honest, just given that point about the Republican Party. And we could go into conservative ideology. We can explain why they think that and the money and all of it. But how do you handle that? Look, the first climate story I got assigned to when I was a cub reporter at ABC News was to go up to Boston and talk to people at Harvard and MIT that had modeled sea level rise. And they had this clunky early animation. And I felt compelled to include like the snarky guy who doesn't believe in climate change. And I just stopped using hairspray. What do you want from me? As a funny aside, which was conflating the ozone layer with the climate. Right, just, right. I, I shudder thinking about that piece and how stupid I was about it. And then a couple of years later, when Al Gore won the Oscar for Inconvenient Truth and it was in the buzz, we did a two hour Earth Day special in prime time at ABC and I was underwater in the Great Barrier Reef talking about coral bleaching and Diane Sawyer turned the lights off in Times Square. And I thought we'd like the conversation had had passed a moment. 
But then Barry Stearns went down and Obama's administration went in all on health care and people stopped talking about it with that urgency. And, it, and then it just from there on, the idea that Nancy Pelosi and Newt Gingrich shot a PSA about the earth together at one point. Never forget. Is, never forget. It's like this. And so it has been this topic has been so politicized and demagogued by a certain class of, of people in this country. But at a certain point, we stopped interviewing the one doctor who says you should smoke a carton a day or the one dentist who encourages sugar gum. Like it, I actually have both them booked coming up after you. I'll sell out. <laughs> they got huge followings. We're I got to promote this show. <laughs> yeah, you got your niche audiences. I get it. <laughs> the, the, uh, niche, they have huge audiences. Uh, way bigger. <laughs> the truth is Rogan or, or Tucker Carlson or any conspiracy theorists have bigger audiences than mainstream journalists by almost every single measure. Rogan is bigger than all the network anchors combined and all the cable, all the climate, all the specialists. And he's radicalized the whole generation, to be fair, full yeah. disclosure. I was on his show. I used to be really good friends with him back in 2019. I was on his show, but I'm, and that's just one guy. There's so many others what, that he have huge followers. Where is he on climate though? I, I heard he had David Wallace Wells on a few years ago and like a very decent conversation. I don't know if he's moved on it ever since uh, then. But. He is... I don't know where he's at on it, and that's a good yeah. point about him having that guest. But I, I do think that when you breed the, you can give me your opinion, but if you seed the ground to question scientific yeah. consensus on vaccines, then you're going to absolutely see those same people, the overlap of people who are in denial about the scientific consensus on vaccines, which is so sound versus climate, which is also so, it's the same people a it's lot of the similar. times. And so I think he, who knows what he believes. Yeah, I get that. The thing I talk about is I like to say that my daughter has this irrational fear of sharks, but I don't blame her. I blame Steven Spielberg, right. who made Jaws right. and turned two notes on a cello and a robotic camera, some a story uh, that was potent enough to scare a generation, sure. right? And so when I go down to Homa, Louisiana, I meet some guys who work in oil and gas, and they watch Fox News. I don't blame them for just living out that story. They're marinating in that story. I blame the storytellers who know better, who absolutely know better right now. Well, you can blame so, you, picked a, doubt. you picked a bad example because it's harder to blame someone who's a, a, a middle class blue collar worker working on a rig who makes his whole living, supports his family from oil and gas. I have a listener uh, who I love, Doug, who works in the coal mines, and he feels constant yeah. guilt about it. He's not in denial about the cent consensus, but everybody else that makes their money in those industries, especially the guys right. working on rigs and so on, like they have a, an interest in believing that. But the, the farmers don't. I don't yeah. give an excuse for other people, I guess is what I'm saying. Not that I'm excusing them. You're yeah. absolutely right. I just know that I dream that one day my daughter will go scuba diving with me. And I know it's not going to happen if I call her an idiot and make fun. Sure, of Sure. I agree with that. that. I'm all about fear. And so we have to connect. We have to at least start with brother. What's your story? Like I did this again down in Louisiana. I did this story where I was interviewing a scientist on a boat to talk about sea level rise. And we just went out with these two brothers who had a boat and got to know that. And they were turned out to be better characters for my piece than the scientists, mm. because one of them believed in climate change and the other one didn't. And these are men of the same blood, same mm. land. But one of them is Republican and the other one's Democrat. One of them has a news diet, you know, is you can predict and the other one doesn't. Yeah. And but they share an invested care for this landscape around them, their fishing camp. They've seen the effects of it and they may differ about what exactly is causing it, but they really care about it. And I know it's really super hard, especially in election years, to lean over the fence with somebody who's got an opposite yard sign of you and say, hey, have you heard about the fishing hole? Or have you seen what they want to do next yeah. to our hiking trail? And connecting with people at that level is, who knows, maybe the civil war you prevent could be your own. But if nothing else, at least you improve the landscape and the environment around you. Have you found anything that you've seen in your work as a journalist, though? You're talking about we as individual Americans trying to listen and, and, and communicate in ways that can hopefully convince people to understand the, the danger that we're in and support policies and politicians that will do something about it. But in terms of your journalism and telling the stories, are there any is there anything that you find more effective? We, you want people who do deny climate science to read your new book. Life as we know it can yeah. be. I know you want them to read it, and I know you wrote it for everybody. So what do you think works or cuts across, if anything? 
I think it is the it's every color in the crayon box. It sure. is good, sometimes good yeah. I, for, for one thing I've learned is the most effective stories I tell have an arc where I can. And the Wonder List was built around this idea. And this is stuff I learned in screenwriting seminars in my year of one in sure. Hollywood about there's a math at, at, to a well-told story. It's why they stick with us. It's how we organize the world. Our homo sapien brains organize the world in stories for efficiency. So when we see a guy walking with a fishing pole, we know what he's doing. We know the story. We don't need to go, why is that guy walking with a strange pole? So once you understand that math, and I tried to employ it in my storytelling where you remind people of the protagonist. Maybe it's this landscape or it's this way of life. Rip the rug out from them. Here's the threat. Here's the turn in the plot. But here's what they're doing to fight it and end up on, on the up note of folks rallying around a solution. And those are the stories that really resonate with people because that's how we organize our our diets around entertainment consumption of things that work and from novels to, to streamable TV. But people, some people say you should, and a lot of times early in the career, it was all about fear. This is happening. This is getting horrible. And there's no arc to that story. The polar bears are dying when I started. The polar bears are still dying when I ended the story. That doesn't move. You actually me. killed a polar bear on camera, which I thought was, <laughs> I was, I was, I was, I thought it was wrong what you did to that bear. And I, but I, I was it's impressed. Ex experimental, ju experiential journalism. I was impressed that you, it was hand to hand. You used no weapons. I, I, I'm unsurprised. You are, you are a strong looking it's, man. This is funny, Pete. Once we were filming, Way up in northern Alaska, like where the Arctic wildlife refuge is uh, and which Trump yeah. had opened up for drilling. So we we're up there yeah. doing that story. And we were, uh, had a drone and we're filming a polar bear eating a dead whale carcass like a half a mile away. And then bringing the drone back, the battery died. And now we had to decide who's going to walk <laughs> towards the polar bear to get it. And should we roll on it? <laughs> <laughs> and can we air the mauling? And then, but we, we is it about. true that you covered your cameraman in lamb's blood and said, get out there, buddy? I, I listen, I got to stay pretty. Exactly. I don't know exactly. why I said lamb's blood. I don't know why the polar bear. That joke was flawed. Uh, so let's get to it. It's a really interesting way that you decided to write this book, Life as We Know It Can Be. And you're using. Our needs, Maslow's hierarchy, the fi the physiological needs, the safety needs, the love and esteem needs. It's really interesting how you wrote this. It's super original. Tell me about the pitch when you decided to to, to do it and and what readers give me the general idea sure. of how you approach it. And then we'll get into it. In 2020, height of the pandemic, I had a 16 year old daughter. I'm now a full time climate reporter and I'd been through a divorce and my new partner very much wanted to get pregnant, but didn't think she could. 42 years old, down to one ovary. And wouldn't you know it, nature finds a way. And I become a new old dad in late 50s. And I'm holding this little bundle in my arms and looking out at a world in lockdown. And that his first year, I would go on to cover the George Floyd protests. And then there was January 6th. And was, I'm sorry, I started writing these letters basically of apology to my son right. about the world that we, we broke the sea in the sky and we shortened the wings of the nightingale. But I'm really glad you're here. And people wrestle with whether to bring kids into this world. I think if you think that kid's going to be a net positive, you're going to raise a helper, bring them like we, and there's so much to wonder and savor and save. And there are so many amazing people doing big things. And so at first the letter was pretty dark and it was much at the plotting of my editor. It was like, find some hope. And it took two years longer than it should have to write the book, but I'm glad it did because policy happened. Technology happened. Um, diplomacy happened in some cases and which gave me before the Paris Accords in 2015, we were on track for five degrees Celsius of heating, 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That's like turning the, the tropics into the movie Dune. That's just unlivable for the band of the planet. Since then, in ways that most of the public can't understand, we're now on track for 2.6 degrees. So we've halved the threat. Still not great. Still going to lose a lot of reefs, a lot of mountain ice. Who knows what's going to happen to sea level rise? How many species are going to lose? But it's a hell of a lot better than where we were headed. And who knows what we're capable of if the story changes and in a motivating way. And the members of the, the guys in the sea, men and women in the C-suites of these 75 giant petrochemical companies and legacy fuel companies, 
those people <laughs> can come around. It seems laughable in some cases, but I hear from p- people in industry who've made their nut and made their grandkids inheritance and know that they they can't spend it on a dead planet and want to change their legacy to something else and are looking for ways to be disruptors in plastics or in thermal battery storage. And so, I don't know, it's a really interesting time uh, to be part of the human experiment. And so I've also went looking for tools. Really, it started as an instruction manual of this kid, like, where are you going to live? What, what kind of house are you going to build? What's the food supply going to look like? And when you boil it back to a lot of our problems are just based on wants and needs, how we define yep. what is a need and what is a want. Yep. And that got me into f- discovering Abraham Maslow, who is this brilliant oldest son of seven kids, immigrants, parents were Ukrainian Jewish cousins who married and lived in Brooklyn. And his mother was a monster, by the way, he describes her just a racist, cruel, punishing woman. Hmm. And despite this Freudian nightmare he grew up in, uh, he spent all his time at the library and he tried to join a gang, a Jewish gang to protect him from the anti-Semitic gangs. And they wanted to initiate him by having him kill a cat. It was just like he was surrounded by cruelty and became obsessed with human nature and studied at University of Wisconsin, did some field work with the Blackfoot tribe up in Canada, and then was teaching at Brooklyn College in 1939. He wrote a theory on human motivation, which doesn't have the shape of a pyramid mentioned, but became known as Maslow's Pyramid of Needs. And if you think about a five sort of story pyramid, ground floor is a physiological stuff, just air, water, temperatures close to 68 degrees, minerals, excretion, sleep. And if you don't have those, the machine shuts down, nothing else matters. Level two is safety needs. It's shelter, rule of law. Information is a safety need. It's all the stuff that goes away after a hurricane that I'm usually covering as people lose their safety needs. And then, but if you have your bellies full and the door is barred, you want to belong. So level three is love to a partner or a tribe level four is esteem. You want to be respected and valued as a, in a, in a social community. And then the tip of the pyramid is self-actualization, like whatever you're meant to be, you should be. And Maslow became obsessed with the generals and the CEOs who are the most self-actualized and studying what made them tick. And so I structured the book around that because when I was growing up, my pyramid of needs was like a freaking amusement park for one. I didn't have <laughs> yeah, to think but, about where the yeah. water, like the cleanliness right. of the sure. water or food. Or I was like, McDonald's was a treat. Like I didn't think about the, the fact that we were building homes with skinny walls and giant furnaces and air conditioners instead of the other way around. I I didn't think about the, the need of community just to not only to feed the soul, but to strengthen and to innovate. And anyway, so that became the structure and just making him reevaluate his little pyramid and building it hopefully in a Your really son. much more sustainable way. Your son. My son. Yeah. yeah. Did you do an audio book for this? I did. Yeah. Because I, I was going to have you read something, but maybe I'll just grab it from uh, the audio book and include it because I, I love the way it opens with this letter to your son. I think that's beautiful, obviously, but let me get to, people should buy the audio book, but let's get to part one, the physiological needs, chapter one, air, two, temperature, three, water, for food. Tell us wh- wh- how you approach this and what happens in this first part of your new yeah. book. Yeah. So I start off thinking about the air that, that we breathe. I tried to make this connection covering the wildfire smoke last summer yeah. when you could see it from New York to Seattle and tried to connect the dots between that f- air you can see and taste is directly related to the carbon dioxide molecules you can't that are coming out of every kind of fuel that burns, every tailpipe, and every factory, every falling leaf, every breath that is create, adding to this big blanket in the sky. Yeah, such a good point. At a certain point, I was talking, I've always bemoaned the way we talk about this. Global warming is mealy. People like warmth and, and yep. greenhouse effect. People aren't afraid of greenhouses unless you're having an affair with the gardener and you don't want somebody to see you. There's nothing scary about that. And... It's not really mobilizing for war. Some people say we got to get a climate like World War II. That was easy to marshal up fighting men and nationalized factories when you had your enemies conveniently dressed in scary uniforms. This is a whole different challenge. I don't know what to call this. And I'm interviewing this scientist fisherman up in Maine. He goes, it's a Godzilla. It's Godzilla. We have uncorked a monster from the depths of the earth 
that helped us with the heavy lifting for a while and expanded our lifespans, but then got so big and destructive, it is now killing our fish and ruining our skiing and killing everything that's good. And we should get mad and go cut up that thing and bury it back where it came from. Is that, that guys, is that a metaphor for like our economic systems? I think it's just a metaphor for this thing of made of, of carbon dioxide, too yeah. much carbon. Like you're talking about more came, about the scientific effect of humans. I'm talking about right. just the global warming, the incentives on why we did it. We've always just burned whatever is the cheapest and most abundant, right? Whether that was peat or whales or kerosene or whatever. Now it happens to be the cheapest forms of energy are solar plus batteries or onshore wind. And so now there's no more excuse that we need to burn this stuff. We have other alternatives. They're ugly. Those are ugly. <laughs> I, I was, uh, I'm an early adapter. I believe that, and I still believe, obviously, the, the main kind of driving moral in my life is pretty simple. Be the change you want to see. And I figured if I've got this platform on national radio at Sirius XM, as I did, and I'm talking about climate as much as I did, probably more than anybody at that time. This is back in 2010 when I first got a Chevy Volt. And yeah. solar panels in the same year. And I just, I was the first person in the neighborhood in the community and no one was impressed. They made fun of me and thought I was stupid. Yeah. My neighbors, does, they look ugly. And, uh, and I actually ended up uh, hurting him very badly. Very badly. <laughs> Hit him in the face with a rake. I can't fight. I, just, I grabbed the closest lawn tool. He didn't come back. But the point is people it is, you say that we have these solutions. People will come up with anything not to adapt to these solutions. And they are also given just so many things that just aren't, they're going to take your gas oven. They're going to take your combustion right. car. They're going to take it. It's such a hard sell for some of these folks. And it's so hard to combat this. I don't mean to go off on this tangent to the point you mentioned about solutions and the needs, but, I, but. no, but I completely agree with you because up until now we've had to imagine a better future and the point I'm trying to make is that Dr. King didn't say I have a nightmare. We, they were living the nightmare. He had a dream right, right. and the dream that includes solar panels, uh, ubiquitous solar panels is now being played out in a way that it wasn't before it, in it. I profile. I was, when I covered hurricane Ian down in Florida, the, the most expensive in yeah. that state's history, terrible. I was hunkered down in a spring Hill suite trying to keep the door shut from the wind with an extension cord talking to Wolf Blitzer. And meanwhile, 15 miles away, this town called Babcock Ranch, the first solar town in America, they never lost power. They were watching the, the hurricane on TV as it blew over them. And that, and it was designed by a guy named Sid Kitson, a former NFL lineman <laughs> who set out to build the most sustainable and safest community in America. And he bought Huge chunk of land, sold most of it back to the state as a nature preserve because it connects Lake Okeechobee and the Gulf and designed with the natural water flow in mind. Didn't get in the way of the historical water patterns. And so his, it never flooded. 100% solar. They buried all their lines. They're still tapped into the grid, but never lost power from from there. And now the next version of that is going to have battery storage for all of these homes and the line to buy in Babcock Ranch, and I guarantee it's not all like Democrats, is off. It's now years long. He's adding 2,000 homes a year as fast as he can with this new model, this new mindset that take politics out of it. It's just much cheaper, much more resilient. Your, your home is much safer. Now, suddenly, instead of you being in the dark for two weeks while your drywall molds, you can become a haven for the people, the neighbors who did get flooded and help do the laundry of the linemen who are trying to get the power back on for the rest of the neighborhoods. And I think we're headed towards an age where a lot of the inefficiency, the waste, the vulnerability to, to big storms and, and power outages is going to be coded out of existence. And the idea that your panels are ugly, I, I'd like to think they're going to be a status symbol one of these days. Not in my town. Thank you, though. <laughs> 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 not on my house in my town. I'm, I'm persona non grata in my town because I'm a progressive guy and I, I live in a very conservative place, a very MAGA place just north of New York City. I live in Rockland County. It's nuts. Talk to me about part two where you talk about safety needs. What about society? You read about our current and future. Yeah. Yeah. So the safety needs is where I really get into shelter and 
spinning off a, a story I told when I was growing up, my dad had moved to Colorado and I got a job working for Prince Bandar of Saudi Arabia, who was building this 55,000 square foot home. He's a Saudi ambassador, really good friends with the, with the Bushes. And it's just this real estate porn. You can imagine just yeah. the ostentatious nature of this place and how at the time it seemed aspirational and how now it seems so ridiculous yeah. in light of other neighborhoods. I, I went to this neighborhood trying to be the first net zero neighborhood in the country in Arvada. And so the travails of trying to build a, a neighborhood without natural gas hookups and mm-hmm. fighting the resistance around that and how to build really smart passive house construction that just tightens up the insulation in ways that you don't need a furnace in some cases. And in the age of wildfire smoke can have the cleanest air in the zip code if you build it right. But while it is also one of the seductive stories of the environmental movement was you need to live off the grid like John Muir and fend for yourself. But I think the opposite is true now is that the strength of communities that are, that have trust in each other, trust in the science that can connect their virtual grids and share power when it's, when it's expensive and sell it when it's cheap is the future. And those will be the models of resilience. Those people will suffer the least come what may. And so it's not just about the latitude of a place. Maybe you are moving to Syracuse or Buffalo because you like the fresh water. You like the geo, the pot clean hydropower from Niagara Falls. You like the landscape there, but it's not just the latitude. It's the attitude. It's the community. It's how accepting they're going to be when climate migration becomes much more evident. They won't be. <laughs> Buffalo declared themselves an official climate refuge city. There are 5,000 Puerto Ricans after Maria went to Buffalo and 3,000 stayed. And some of those mayors are like, hey, maybe this is a way to revive the Rust Belt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, out I, towns. I, I think that would be beautiful. I know Buffalo and I know Puerto Ricans are Americans and they're not Haitians and they're not Syrians and they're not mm-hmm. Mexicans. And let's be honest, where the migration will come from the poorest countries, the people who have the least responsibility for the problem will be, of course, the ones that are hurt the most. And the idea of accepting refugees for any reason, it's always been a Christian idea in America, certainly, but then not so much anymore. As we all know, if we don't look like me, don't come to my town. I don't care what the reason is. I think there's going to be a lot. Of, there's absolutely there's that. But there's also a lot of just internal American migration of people. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. Like looking at looking around at Florida and going, OK, yeah. Can't get a is a policy. better idea these days. Yeah. 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 Let's talk about part three. And I, I am not doing any justice to this amazing book and the way that you wrote <laughs> it. But I want to give you an opportunity to just touch on the four parts here. The love and esteem needs of the hierarchy, the pyramid uh-huh. about connection and communication. You've touched on it a little bit, but say whatever else you want. Sure. This one's this. The, the, the later chapters are really addressed to my daughter, who's now 20 and and Olivia is her name. Olivia, and you and, you and your ex-wife uh, thought that that was an original name, just like my, <laughs> we thought Ava would be an original name for my daughter. And there's 7,000 Olivias and Avas. Everywhere you go, you turn your head because you think your daughter's name is being called. Anyway, that's right. Bad. My daughter's best friend's name is Ava. So there you go. Exactly. So my daughter only has friends named Olivia, all of her friends. Everyone yeah. Knows. The Where I come at it from this one for me is, I think, one of my deepest regrets as a parent was I was at Nightline and I was the tech guy. So I was covering a lot of Silicon Valley stories and had done the early days of Facebook and Twitter and all that. And I went out to interview Kevin Systrom, the creator of this little thing called Instagram. And he had just sold his app to Facebook for a billion dollars. And it was still somewhat of a novelty. And I came back from that story. And my daughter and I have the same birthday. And on the, the day she was born, I got my first iPad or my first uh, iPod, the, the original mm-hmm. spinning wheel one. Yeah, and it was like, oh, I got an iPod and a daughter on my on this birthday. Good one. That was a good one. And so 10 years later, I take her to the Apple store and buy her a phone and I show her how to use Instagram. And I thought that we were helping her fill her safety needs at the bottom of the pyramid, stay in touch, and and maybe a little bit of her love needs around her fellow Taylor Swift fans or something but I didn't know we were giving her a, 
an anxiety machine that was right. going to mainline the worst parts of yeah, human might as well start with, we might, I did the same thing and we might as well just give them a pack of cigarettes and a bottle exactly. of whiskey. Exactly. They've been better off. <laughs> and so quit smoking after ten years, it's not permanent damage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, taper off. So it's a re examination of just how we interact with each other and how we um, how we fulfill those love needs with these virtual thumbs ups or these hearts of people. I'm not keeping in touch with my high school roommates that way. I need to see them. I need to hug them. I need to take walks in the woods with these people. And I hope that there's been this awakening. It's super hard. I don't know how I'm going to do it with River. You got to create a community, a bubble like Jonathan Haidt is preaching now, the author of The Coddling of the American Mind, and really come out. In after terms of the phone use, you're specifically in saying. In terms of yeah. phone use, yeah. yeah. And when in terms yeah. of telling your kid, you don't need a smartphone until you're yeah. 16 you can get by with a flip phone somehow the generation Good luck. before you Good survive. Good luck to all those. Jonathan hates ideas. Sound great. Good luck yeah. in reality. But I think we got to fight it because I refuse yep. to go into a world with like virtual hikes in virtual woods with our headsets. That if we can't get this kid in love with what's left of nature and invested in it and, and plugged into it, we don't have a whole lot of hope of saving it. And I'm preaching to her on my regrets. And I talk about my Twitter addiction. I would, I at first was using it to fill my, my physiological needs to feed myself, to stay connected as a journalist, to, to fill my safety needs of career and being plugged in and share my work. But when I was using it to fill my love and esteem needs and just popping off and doing what I did in third grade, trying to make everybody laugh, it wasn't helpful. It wasn't <laughs> filling me up in a soulful way. I don't think it added much to Twitter. Worse. I mean, I, I knew your work, obviously, on t- television, uh, but I found you there and liked you. So for whatever Thank it's you. Worth. Yeah. yeah, and it's true. And, and just like any tool we have. And appreciate it when you acknowledge my existence. Like the first time I was like, oh, Bill Weir is saying hi to me. So of I'm course. just saying like there were some good parts, but you're obviously explaining what we all Certainly in, in journalism or media experience, you're doing that very well. And I'm interrupting you with the tiny good parts. But so go ahead. Yeah. Once that. But no. And, and that came out of the very pure human need to connect. Yep. I want to be Pete's friend. And I, I think he's smart and funny. And I, and I want to be a, get his approval on what I say. Right. And, and but, vice versa. Yeah. But, but the, having this in between us is short circuiting that for us evolutionarily and just, and, but this is a tool just like a flame or a blade. And depending on who is holding it, it can heal you like a surgeon or it can take your wallet or it can warm you or it can burn your house down. And AI is just going to supercharge this in ways we can't even fathom yet. Uh, let's get to the final part and some hope. Self actualization actualization is really important. Chapter 10, you right. you, as we you, as we know you, can be. What's that about? Yeah. The title is Life as We Know It Is Not Over. It's Life as We Know It, or Life is Not Over. Life as We Know It is changing. Right. The, the physical world, the energy streams are changing. But Life as We Know It Can Be is what I'm really shooting for here. The proven ideas, the technology we already have, the connections we can make. And you, as we know you can be, like, what do I want my son to be? And, and Maslow, late in his life, has, was ready to scrap the top of his pyramid. He figured, he realized that self-actualized people weren't really about self at all. They didn't care about what it is they were doing as much as a, a number of 14 different values, universal values, and you would represent this. So you're a good example of someone who you're drawn to be a, a communicator, a comedian. At the heart of every comedian is truth. You want to call out truth. You want to call out hypocrisy. And I think you probably feel very strongly about fairness. These are values that are as much a part of you as your spleen. You ask a lawyer, why do you practice law? I care about the law. They care about fairness. And there's beauty and other of these universal values, cohesion, humor, Things like that. and Maybe name and, a profession where people are thought of as good people. You said lawyers and comedians. They're the worst. We're the worst people. Like, <laughs> would you knock on with teacher or teacher. paramedic? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> no, I see exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And go ahead. Sorry. But the and so I, I, I went looking for sort of people who exemplify those values, sure. who are leading, who have been through it, who Archie Kalepa, who is a, this legendary lifeguard in Maui who his entire community burned down in that wildfire and watching the way he managed that disaster, not only filling the bottom of his neighbor's pyramids with food and water and medicine, 
but also filling their love and esteem needs, the way that he held community meetings, the way he engaged them in the, their darkest days. And we need that kind of good neighbor. The best tip I got covering climate was Mr. Rogers, who said, who told him, he said, when he would see a scary event on TV, his mother told him to look for the helpers. helpers. Yeah. And I'm trying to just raise some helpers yeah. here. And whether they go into it from a science field or from my daughter wants to perform musical theater. And I hope she uses her voice in a way that's productive and leaves the planet a little bit better off. But ultimately, I argue that if we do connect with our neighbors around the bottom of the pyramid, around our air and water and our shared need for safety and resiliency within a community, we'll end up filling those love and esteem needs in ways that just yoga retreats or or Instagram likes can't ever fill. And maybe it's quaint. Maybe I'm a little hokey and, I'm, and, and it's a, the result of being a new old dad being wistful. But I really think there's so much more good we could be talking about on this topic. And just people don't want to talk about it. You've uh, been doing it. And this book is beautiful and wonderful and generous and hopeful and inspiring. Unfortunately, I know River does want to be a coal executive, so I'm not sure if you're working. <laughs> Weird. It's not. It's, you try so hard, Bill, and yet it's just sometimes they rebel. Sometimes they rebel. They always do. They always do. He literally just cut the top off a mountain. Uh, he's interning in West Virginia. It's, it's, it's my a, little fracker, my Fisher Price. <laughs> you got him a my little fracker onesie, and I just think that was probably contradictory to the mission that you set out on, and hypocritical even to the book. Opening. It is really? wonderful. Life is we know it can be. Stories of people, climate, and hope in a changing world. Buy it for your kids. Buy it for your friends. You're leading the charge. I so respect it. Like I said at the beginning, I was so happy that you were on this beat and that CNN is resourcing it. And congratulations. Keep it up. Come back and talk to me anytime. It's so great to finally connect, Bill. Thank you. And congrats. Likewise. Likewise, Pete. You're so easy to talk to, brother. Thank you for the kindness. And there you have it, everybody. Bill Weir, first time on the show, and I thought it was a great appearance, and it will definitely not be the last time. Life as we know it can be my search for a world worth passing down. So great. Really enjoyed that conversation. I hope you did as well. Go tell Bill on Twitter. Go right now. He'll see it. He's very active still, at Bill Weir CNN. Follow him, get the book, watch him there, and we'll talk to him again, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Right now, it's John Carroll taking us out, Bumblebees. I love you very much. You know it. I feel it. You're never alone. If you're part of the stand-up community, I hope you know that and feel it. John Carroll always does as he sings to us. In and out. Let's go. JohnCarroll.org if you haven't bought the song. Bye-bye. I think you're driving wheels in a leak and grease. Boy, you better stand up. Keep right on ignoring us if we keep sitting tight. We got to open up the window to let in some light. You got to stand up. That's right. We got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eye. We got to let him know it's his turn to go. See it clear and all you hear is a lie. Don't get up off of your butt. Get down off of your fence. Stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town. Just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you laying down. Boy, oh, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. Tis the place where every lost child will finally be found. There's only one thing to do before we stand our ground, and that's stand. Would begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go. And make it clear when all we hear is 